Grayman is supported by Patreon. Donate now and receive special early access. I'm the Gray Man, and it's the end, but the moment has been prepared for. After seven long years in the driver's seat, Stephen Moffat is stepping down as the head writer and showrunner of Doctor Who, with Peter Capaldi's final episode this Christmas serving as his swan song. Now, it's safe to say that Moffat's run on the show has been controversial. And that's all I'm gonna say about that! Regardless, Moffat's impact on the show is undeniable, so it only feels right to take it all in, for good and for ill. In the end, Moffat's written some good stuff, some average stuff, and some stuff that's outright crap. So today, we're gonna take a look at the top six best and worst Stephen Moffat episodes. Now, you're probably wondering why this is a top six versus, say, a top ten or even a top five. Well, Moffat got to preside over two Doctors with three seasons each, so I felt it was only fair that Matt Smith and Peter Capaldi got equal time. Couple of ground rules. First off, I'm only covering episodes Stephen Moffat is a credited writer on. So even if it's a good episode like Flatline or a shit episode like Forest of the Night, Moffat didn't write either of those, so they're not on the list. Second, I will only be covering episodes after Moffat took over as showrunner, so none of the episodes he wrote for the Russell T. Davies era. If you want a top six of those episodes, here you go. Come on, you knew Blink was gonna be number one anyway. Finally, a weird trend I've noticed is that Moffat's successes eerily mirror his failures. He's the king of two steps forward, three steps back. Therefore, my choices on best versus worst will be episodes that show this trend side by side. So I'll be showing one episode that succeeded and complement it with another episode that failed. With that out of the way, let's get started. Oh, and um, spoilers. 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 Number six best. The Zygon Inversion. Series 8 got kind of a mixed reception, and a lot of ideas they had about this new, darker Doctor didn't really pan out. Series 9 decided to shake things up by lightening the 12th Doctor up somewhat. There we go. But also tried an experiment of giving us a season of nothing but two-parters, giving Doctor Who fans a taste of the classic show format while maintaining the modern production. Perhaps the best of this lot was the story where a splinter group of Zygons try to disturb the peace agreed on in the day of the Doctor and try to take over the world. The leader of the Splinter Zygons, nicknamed Bonnie, ends up taking Clara's form and tries to break into Unit Headquarters to find an ultimate weapon that'll bring the Earthlings to their knees. This episode had some uncomfortable real-world connotations, as London had just suffered a terrorist attack shortly before airing. But there's still a lot to like from a storytelling and acting perspective. We get a major supporting turn for Osgood, Jenna Coleman gets an extremely fun villain turn as Bonnie, the Doctor is carrying on in rare form with the whole Doctor Disco bit. Doctor, Doctor Funkenstein. Yes, we know who you are. Capaldi gets one of the all-time best monologues the Doctor has ever delivered about war and conflict. If Capaldi had submitted this scene for award consideration, he'd have knocked it out of the park. When you fire that first shot, no matter how right you feel, you have no idea who's going to die! How many hearts will be broken? How many lives shattered? How much blood will spill until everybody does what they were always going to have to do from the very beginning? Sit down and talk! Moffat collaborated on this episode with Peter Harness, who got off to a rocky start with the poorly received Kill the Moon. Thankfully, both were able to come together and deliver a classic two-parter. Do you ever think it is? It's just a fancy word for changing your mind. Number six worst. The Pyramid at the End of the World. Hey, you know what's the worst? A story that depends on everyone being stupid in order to proceed. This episode is the second part of the Monks trilogy, a story that increasingly bogged down the otherwise solid season 10. The first part, Extremis, was actually really good, giving us some creepy atmosphere and a genuinely clever ending and solution. If it had just ended there, it might have even made the best of list, but unfortunately it's tied to this dreck. Now, fans' first instinct was to blame co-writer Peter Harness, who, as I said in the previous entry, already had a poor reputation. But this is a rare occasion where the poor quality of the episode is somewhat tied to a real-world tragedy. You see, Stephen Moffat's mother was dying in the hospital when he was working on this script, with him even working on it next to her deathbed. As a result, he wasn't able to iron out the flaws in the script like he and the writing staff normally would have. Said Moffat himself, Peter deserved better from me, frankly. 
my heart goes out to Moffat, and for that reason, I've put this episode at the bottom of the list. That said, the flaws are still too great to ignore. The whole conflict is put in place because of one idiotic scientist who couldn't be bothered with basic safety or even showing up to work sober. The conflict is exacerbated by none of the Earth leaders trusting the Doctor, even though they know he's dealt with hundreds of alien menaces like this in the past. And everything comes to a head just because the Doctor couldn't tell Bill that he was blinded in a previous story. Who would have thought the Doctor's greatest enemy would be the world's most poorly designed lock? One of the few bright spots in this episode is Rachel Denning as Erica, the more competent scientist in the lab. There's nothing in the script that necessitated casting a little person, but for my part I'm happy they did, and found it refreshing that the episode treated it as a non-issue like it should be. But yeah, this story is just dumb and infuriating. Ugh, seriously, they couldn't stick some braille on that thing? Number 5 Best The Pilot it had been over a year since the last time we saw Peter Capaldi, and during that time both he and Moffat announced that they'd be leaving the show after Season 10. But, rather cleverly, instead of trying to go out with a big epic story, Season 10 decided to get more personal and character-oriented, and the pilot sets up that new paradigm perfectly. We get to know the Twelfth Doctor all over again as we see him teaching at a university, apparently retired from time traveling for unexplained reasons. We see him through the eyes of Bill, a worker in the school commissary played by Pearl Mackey. As a crush of hers gets tied up in some extraterrestrial shenanigans, it's up to her and the Doctor to figure out what's going on. A huge part of this episode depends on us liking Bill, and Pearl Mackey knocks it out of the park. Within just 15 minutes, we get to see her have dimension, and her unique perspective and inquisitive mind makes it easy to see why the Doctor would find potential in her. We also get to know Nardo, who becomes the secret weapon for this season. What makes this interesting, though, is that the pilot functions as a perfectly legitimate entry point for the show. It helps if you know some of the continuity and history behind some scenes or moments, but the episode is not dependent on it. And strange as it sounds, after the long gap, that wasn't completely out of line. So Moffat is the rare Doctor Who producer, and the first in the new series, to give fans not one jumping on point, but two. But we'll get to that. Number 5 Worst Asylum of the Daleks Meanwhile, here's how you don't introduce a character. The Doctor gets summoned to the Parliament of the Daleks to deal with a threat they're having thanks to a human party landing on one of their prison planets. Amy and Rory get dragged along, but are hesitant to help since they were working on getting divorced before they were summoned. As they get closer to the center of the planet, they discover that a young woman named Osgood may be the key to all this confusion. If I had to sum up this episode, it would be... pointless. None of the plot points this episode addresses were brought up before or referenced again. Amy and Rory getting ready to divorce comes right the fuck out of nowhere. In the previous episode we saw them, they were ready to have Christmas dinner with the Doctor after they hadn't seen him for two years. Here, they're within seconds of signing the papers, but end up reconciling at the end of the episode. You'd think there'd be a big plot point of the Daleks actually forgetting the Doctor at the end of the episode, but that's undone by their next appearance. Also, while it's fun to see old Dalek models lying around in the asylum, the Dalek puppets just look stupid. Way to make a creepy concept, not scary. And finally, we think we're going to meet Clara, who was already announced as the new companion at this point, but that's a fake out too, but we'll get to that later. So we have three, count them, three major plot points introduced in this episode that should have had major ramifications for the show, and they're all dropped by the time the end credits roll. Season 7 was the biggest mixed bag of the Matt Smith era, and starting things off like this, it's no surprise to see why. Just a big old ball of meh. Next episode. Number 4 Best A Good Man Goes to War A bunch of mysteries related to the Order of the Silence come to a head when they kidnap a pregnant Amy Pond and try to imbue her child with Time Lord DNA as a weapon to use against the Doctor. Their leader, Madame Kavarian, has recruited the Papal Mainframe as security and are waiting on high alert at the meteor base of Demon's Run for the Doctor to arrive. There's a lot to gush about with this episode, so I'm just gonna go in order. First off, the opening is awesome, with Rory taking up the mantle of the last Centurion again and storming the Cyberman base for information on Amy's whereabouts. Rory has truly come into his own as a character this season and is a stone-cold badass this entire episode. Where is my wife? Oh, don't give me those blank looks. Second, this is the episode that introduces the Paternoster Gang, one of the best supporting cast in the history of the show. Vostra and Jenny were so popular, fans almost immediately demanded they get their own spin-off, and it's a shame that never happened. Strax the Suntaran Medic is also hilarious in almost anything he does and says. I hope someday to meet you in the glory of battle, but I shall crush the life from your worthless human form. Try and get some rest. 
Actually, even the one-off characters in this episode are really good. The Headless Monks are so creepy and awesome, I'm sad they never appeared again after this episode. Lorna Bucket is adorably tragic, and you even have comic relief like the fat one and his husband, the thin one. Third, even on the limited budget the show has, they had the Doctor pull out all the stops with the army he uses to finally infiltrate Demon's Run, featuring a ton of fun callbacks and some of Matt Smith's most memorable acting. Look, I'm angry, that's new. I'm really not sure what's going to happen now. And while I'm not going to spoil the ending, it ends on a really satisfying reveal that leaves you pumped to watch the next episode. I didn't put the second part, Let's Kill Hitler, on the list because of the tone shift and some continuity problems that do make it a bit of a come down from such an intense episode. Not least of which the entirety of Torchwood Miracle Day happening in between episodes and nobody so much as acknowledges it. But that's fine by me. Giant stone vagina, my ass. Number four worst. The Snowman. A good man goes to war showed how you do a good mid-season finale. This shows how you do a bad mid-season premiere. The Doctor has been sulking in 19th century London after Amy and Rory have left, refusing to travel and moonlighting as a detective with the Paternoster gang. Meanwhile, the Great Intelligence has been psychically possessing snow to form ice creatures to take over the world. Another version of Clara, this time a governess moonlighting as a barmaid, tries to figure out what's going on and encourage the Doctor to come out of retirement and save everyone. Unlike Asylum of the Daleks, I wouldn't call this episode pointless. What I would call it is terribly uninteresting. New Who has revived plenty of classic villains from the old show, but the Great Intelligence is not one of them. We haven't seen the Great Intelligence since the second Doctor's era, and in my opinion was a poor choice as an arc villain for season 7. I don't care if you got Ian McKellen to voice it, all I see is an angry snow globe in the middle of your parlor. Speaking of which, the snowmen also aren't scary. The whole time I keep thinking of the abominable snow goons from Calvin and Hobbes. I also have a hard time believing the Doctor would just up and retire after Amy and Rory have gone. He's certainly been sad when companions leave, yes, but he's always been able to carry on in the face of tragedy. Come to think of it, he's retired here, he's retired in the pilot, and it's implied he retires in Day of the Doctor. I could retire and be the curator of this place. Moffat, this show is about time and space. Why are you trying to take the time and space away? And finally, we get another fake out with Clara. The version in this episode isn't the real Clara either. One fake out is already testing the patience with audiences. Now this is just getting asinine. There are some positives to this episode, not least of which we get to hang out with the Paternoster gang some more. Now, I'm a lizard woman from the dawn of time, and this is my wife. And the reveal of the new console room gives me a big old nerd boner every time I see it. But yeah, boring mystery with uninteresting villains. Forgive the pun, but this one just left me out in the cold. I resent your implication of impropriety. Number three best. The Time of the Doctor. Season 7 will always have the 50th anniversary specials, but other than that, it was a wildly uneven year, and a sad note for Matt Smith to go out on. Fortunately, though, it stuck the landing with Time of the Doctor, one of the best regeneration stories in the show's history. The Doctor finds himself trapped on Trenzalore, the planet he's fated to die on in a great battle against all of his enemies. Trenzalore exists in a truth bubble, so everyone there can only speak the truth. There, the Doctor finds a crack in space that leads back to Gallifrey, freshly restored from Day of the Doctor. All he has to do is speak his true name and the Time Lords can return. But with all of the Doctor's enemies in orbit around Trenzalore, bringing them back is guaranteed to reignite the Time War. Forced into a stalemate, the Doctor dedicates himself to defending the people on Trenzalore for as long as he can. But as the years pass and he ages, the Doctor discovers he's finally out of regenerations, meaning this could truly be his last stand. Oh, and he's trying to help Clara cook a Christmas turkey, as if he didn't have enough to think about. As you can no doubt tell, this episode is packed and has a lot to wrap up as Matt Smith's final adventure. Supposedly, Moffat considered a year-long arc where the Doctor was trapped on Trenzalore and each episode he had to fight off a new invader. But when Matt Smith announced he was leaving, Moffat instead decided to take all of his best ideas and cram them into one episode. Under those circumstances, it's remarkable this works as well as it does. The cracks in space, the order of the silence, Gallifrey returning, the name of the Doctor, answering the question about the Doctor's number of regenerations, this episode has a lot to wrap up, but it does so excellently. Yeah, I wish some things had been more fleshed out, but after Moffat got drunk on asking too many questions with not enough answers, I'm happy with an all-killer, no-filler approach. Heck, this episode is so thorough, it fills in a plot hole from David Tennant's era about the Metacrisis Doctor. Matt Smith gets to play every possible emotion here in his final turn. Silly, sad, righteous, vulnerable, and finally heartwarming, with perhaps the best final speech yet in the new series. Good night, Raggedy Man. We'll miss you. I will always remember when the Doctor was me. Number three worst. The Bells of St. John. 
Time of the Doctor showed how to say goodbye to a character. Bells of St. John shows how to not introduce one. The Great Intelligence has traveled to 20th century London and is trapping souls in a massive Wi-Fi network. The Doctor discovers Clara is in the 20th century and decides to go meet her for real to figure out why she keeps reappearing across history. While there, she gets wrapped up in the Great Intelligence's plan, and it's up to her and the Doctor to save the day. You've probably noticed by now that I've put all three of Clara's introduction episodes on this list. There's a reason for that! You shouldn't need three episodes to introduce somebody! I really didn't intend to bash Clara as much as I have on this list. I feel bad about it because Jenna Coleman is a genuinely good actress and has plenty of chemistry with Matt Smith and later Peter Capaldi. But that's all presentation. On paper, they completely drop the ball with her character. Bells of St. John sets up an unfortunate trend where the plot of any given episode is less about what's going on and more about the Doctor's obsession with Clara, which, even if it's played for comedy, still comes off as creepy in this episode. Do you just crook your finger and people just jump in your snog box and fly away? It is not a snog box. I'll be the judge of that. The problem with this obsession is not only does it derail the story, but Clara herself isn't very well defined by this point as a character. This is the third version of her we've met so far, so we literally don't know what to think about her. She's a mystery first and a character second, which just hangs a big albatross around all of her episodes. And this one is no exception. Once again, the Great Intelligence proves to be an uninteresting villain, and the haunted Wi-Fi is a good idea with a weak and kind of nonsensical execution. What's worse, Clara doesn't join the Doctor in the TARDIS at the end of the episode. Come back tomorrow. Why? If I was tomorrow, I might say yes. Oh my god, lady, we've had to put up with three episodes of this crap. Are you getting on the spaceship or not? I had huge problems with Clara until the bitter end, but thankfully she became a better defined character by the time Peter Capaldi came on. Here, I'm not given a reason to care, and the reveal of her connection to the Doctor is seriously underwhelming. To quote the Sheik Geeks, I was hoping she was someone more interesting, to be honest. Number 2 Best Heaven Sent The Doctor finds himself locked up alone inside a castle with a dangerous creature that'll kill him on contact. The castle is able to shift rooms on the fly, making it difficult to find the way out. Having just lost Clara in the previous episode, the Doctor has to find his way out while dealing with his grief, and also trying to figure out who imprisoned him in the first place. The Doctor has always found the best part of himself thanks to the company of his companions, but what does he do when he's all by himself? What does he do when everything has been taken from him? Well, the good news is that he's still the Doctor. He's still analytical, he's still passionate, he's still determined, and he's still a bit ruthless when the occasion calls for it. If you were any part of killing her, and you're not afraid, then you understand nothing at all. This entire episode is down to Moffat's script, Capaldi's simmering burn of a performance, and Rachel Talale's direction. It's making Doctor Who without a net. But at the same time, it's a story that gives you space to take everything in, to go somewhere the show has never gone before, and have the Doctor be at his most vulnerable. It also has the Doctor at his most clever, showing his thought process while in danger, and also has a killer ending once he finally figures out everything that's been going on. To talk about it anymore would spoil the experience. By any definition, this episode is a triumph. I'm nothing without an audience. Number 2 Worst Hell Bent I really didn't want to put this episode this high on the list. I didn't even want to put it on the list at all, but... I eventually realized that if I didn't, I'd be lying to myself. Hellbent is the nadir of what Moffat has been doing ever since he introduced Clara, making the show all about her. Arguably, in spite of defining her personality more when Capaldi came on, the trade-off was all of his important moments being overshadowed by her. Instead of Deep Breath being about the Doctor making sense of his new regeneration cycle, he's concerned about whether or not Clara will stay with him. Instead of Death in Heaven being about the Doctor confronting Missy and her army of Cybermen, it's about Clara's boring romance with Danny Pink. So instead of Hellbent being about the Doctor, after ten long seasons finally being back on Gallifrey and confronting the Time Lords after the Time War, it's once again all about Clara. The episode doesn't even bother to mention how the Time Lords got back into our universe. What's more, it's the episode that acknowledges how toxic their relationship is and ends with the Doctor wiping all of his memories of her. Or maybe he didn't and they kinda came back? Oh, who fucking cares at this point? Three seasons we've had to make excuses for this companion and figure out what the fuck she's all about, and in the end the Doctor just forgets it all? What was the fucking point?! And what's Clara's send-off? She's apparently immortal and flies around in a 1950s diner with Arya Stark. Uh, somehow we all knew it would end this way. And now it's time for some honorable mentions. Listen. 
The Doctor tries to trace the source of fear itself, considering it the driving point that motivates all life. Moffat's always been inclined to create original monsters for the Doctor to face, but the threat here is more evocative, preying instead on subconscious fears we can't name or place. A great experimental episode that doesn't give in to the temptation to use a rubber monster and instead plays on our fears of the unseen. Great episode, but too far from the normal template to make the list. A Christmas Carol. Still easily the best of the Christmas specials, if for nothing else that it's actually about Christmas. Michael Gambon is amazing, and there's a bittersweetness to the proceedings that makes it very profound as well as touching. Despite the best attempts, no other Christmas special has yet touched this one. The Day of the Doctor. This episode is a triumph by any definition. Any chance to have John Hurt is a good one, and in a single hour we buy him as a new incarnation of the Doctor. Not to mention finally tying up the fate of Gallifrey and the Time War once and for all in a moment so epic it united the internet in simultaneous fanboy squee. The only reason it's not properly on the list is it's such a milestone episode, I felt it would throw off the criteria of my other choices. And finally, The Curse of Fatal Death. Even though it's a comic relief episode, only a true Doctor Who fan could have written this. Hilarious from beginning to end. And technically the first time we got a female doctor. Grrr, Joanna. Number one worst. The Return of Doctor Mysterio. While tracking an alien threat on Christmas Eve, the doctor accidentally gives a young boy named Grant superpowers. Years later, while investigating a research company, he discovers Grant has grown up to be a superhero called the Ghost and works as a nanny for a reporter named Lucy, whom he has a crush on. Together, he and the Doctor try to stop the alien threat while also reconciling Grant's two separate identities. The premise itself isn't bad. Doctor Who does a superhero story. Okay, fine. We have never seen that before on the show. That could be interesting. The problem, though, is that this episode plays every single superhero cliché straight to an almost bizarrely slavish degree. I would have thought Moffat would have something more original to say, but he even tries to get a joke out of the Doctor pointing out Clark Kent and Superman look exactly alike. Dude, that joke is so old it could vote. There's also the fact that this is a Christmas special, and the strength of Moffat's Christmas specials was that they were all about Christmas in some way. Here, the holiday isn't even a theme, and it's barely mentioned. But my biggest annoyance with this episode is that it was chosen to be the Christmas special at all. Doctor Who had been off the air for a year when this episode aired, and ratings had already been steadily declining for years during Moffat's tenure. However, he decided to give it one more go and do a final season before passing things over to Chris Chibnall and Jodie Whittaker. This episode should have been a blowout, a refreshing reminder as to why we love this show in the first place and get us hyped for season 10. And what do we get? This episode isn't the most poorly made, or most boring, or even the most offensively bad, but a run-of-the-mill cliché fest that features clichés from a completely different genre released during a time when we really, really needed hype for Doctor Who? Moffat, if this is the best you can offer us, maybe it really is time for you to go. Number 1 Best The Eleventh Hour I can't confirm this, but I've always secretly wondered if the BBC had no faith in Doctor Who without David Tennant and Russell T. Davies running the show. It's bad enough that there was a lot of online controversy over Matt Smith's casting, but the show was bringing in new companions, a new TARDIS set, and filming in HD. Everything was changing, and there was the legitimate chance it might not have worked. Even season ender The Big Bang has the tone of a series finale, but fortunately the show got renewed, so in the end it came off more like a victory lap. But it all came down to this, Matt Smith's first episode, The Eleventh Hour. What I find so impressive about this episode is you literally need to know nothing about the Doctor other than he's just regenerated. We get some cute shenanigans as he gets used to his new taste buds, and some temporal shenanigans with Amy Pond, but once the alien threat has presented itself, it all comes down to one humble request. Just 20 minutes. Just believe me, for 20 minutes. So there we are. Without his TARDIS, his sonic screwdriver, or even new clothes, he stops the alien threat. Who the man? But it doesn't stop there. He calls them back for a scolding, giving us one of the best establishing character moments in the show's history. Honoring those who came before him, but giving the new guy a chance to shine. Basically... Run. And just when you think it can't get any better, we get to see the wonderful new TARDIS console room and are invited to go on even more adventures. For all the controversy of Moffat's tenure as head writer, he gave us not just a continuation, but a brand new beginning. A whole new universe full of possibilities. An episode so good, it's in the middle of season 5, and I still recommend newcomers watch it as their starting point. And even after all this time, I'd still consider it his greatest triumph as a writer. Goodbye, Nedworth. Hello, everything. (laughs) 
So that was my best and worst of Stephen Moffat. Final thoughts? Moffat has screwed up plenty in his time running Doctor Who, but to act like nothing he did was good wouldn't just be disingenuous, it'd be straight up false. In fact, I think fans wouldn't be so irritated with him if there wasn't something there we really liked and responded to originally. Reviewing all these episodes, I think Moffat's biggest crime is that he stayed on too long. If he had left when Matt Smith did, I think he'd be much better regarded and wouldn't have worn out his welcome like he did. He came in with all the goodwill in the world, but it became very apparent after a while he had a limited bag of tricks and Lord knows his public statements didn't help any. We had promises of something greater, but in the end, Doctor Who just became another sci-fi show. A well-made, entertaining sci-fi show, but just another show nonetheless. And what about getting the first female Doctor? Well, the criticism that I find the funniest is, oh well, the BBC is just doing it to get higher ratings. Yes! Yes they are! Just like every other television show. And you know what? It's working! Cause I'm gonna watch! Doctor Who is all about change. New actors, new characters, new locations, new stories. However, the 13th Doctor turns out it'll be something new, which the show desperately needed. Seven years is long enough to be doing anything, and even with the mixed reception of Stephen Moffat's era, it was probably time for him to hang it up. Still, every era of Doctor Who has had to deal with the good and the bad from every contributor to pass through its halls. It doesn't make the bad things go away, but it doesn't mean the good things didn't matter. On the other hand, Sherlock season four, yeah, we can all agree that shit was inexcusable. Don't blink. Blink and you're dead.